uh, preaching in a pro- post-Christian culture and all of that. And, and I want to deal with this question that pops up periodically uh, in, in people's minds. And, and it even popped up in Jeremiah's thoughts, and we'll see that in the text. And the question is, why do the wicked prosper? And, uh, and I'll, every once in a while over the years, I'll hear someone say, why do, why do the wicked prosper? And there are some scriptures that even ask that kind of a question. And um, of course, we're going to look at two questions today that are in the text. But uh, it starts with, why do the wicked prosper? Um, and maybe you've been one of the people that have wondered about that. But I want to say, when we begin to ask that question, and this was also true of Jeremiah, when we begin to look around us and ask the question, why do the wicked prosper? We know we're looking at everything with earthly eyes. The real question is, do the wicked prosper? Is it really possible for things to end well without walking with God? So we begin to realize, actually, the wicked don't prosper. And, and if you've ever had to you know, deal with, with people who don't walk with the Lord and, and per, for whatever reason they involve you in some of their trials and, and struggles, and maybe you do counseling or something like that, uh, you, you begin to realize, wow, all of that, all of that drama, all of that heartache, all of that struggle could have been prevented by obedience to the Lord. It's amazing. And, and back in the day when I did a lot of, of interpersonal counseling, there would be times I'd come home and, and we still had kids at home and, and I'd, I'd come home and I'd say things like, man, I just, I love our house. I love our kids. I love our life. And Debbie would say, you had a bad day, didn't you? A lot of problems today in people's lives. But you better start praising the Lord for the wholesomeness that's in your own. Because that's how it'll stay there. And so let's look at Jeremiah chapter 12. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. And he begins with this. And it's a... Chapter, verse 1 really caught my attention, uh, and I, I, I love it, and you'll see why in a minute. It says, Oh Lord, even if I would argue my case with you, you would always be right. Now, isn't that a great sentence? And, and uh, so it continues, Yet I, I want to talk to you about your justice. Now, that's the funny part of it. Why do the treacherous people have peace and quiet? And he goes on, verse 2, you plant them, they take root, they grow, they produce fruit, they speak well of you with their lips, but their hearts are far from you. And, And I just think that is so typically human of Jeremiah, which is okay since he was a human. But, but you start out and you say, God, you know, if I were to question you, I, I know you're always right. That said, I want to question you because I'm not sure you are. Right? Isn't that what he's saying? Yeah, it's like, I know you're always right, but I need to talk to you about your justice because it doesn't look right to me. And and what I'll suggest to you is that if you don't think God's justice looks right to you, it's because your perspective is skewed, not his. And you're looking at things with earthly eyes instead of heavenly eyes. And and when we ask those kind of questions, how many know this? And I'm not picking on Jeremiah, but it doesn't hurt a little bit. But we know when we ask questions like that, it's like, well, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't question you. You're always right, but I need to talk to you about your justice. And when we ask a question, why do the wicked succeed? We actually are making a suggestion to the Lord. We're saying, Lord, I don't think the wicked should succeed. 
And, and think about that in your prayer life for a minute. How much do you believe in the power of God's authority over all that's happening? Do you just believe in God's authority over planet Earth and the universe a little bit? Or do you believe in it completely? So someone this week was asking me, uh, not someone from our area, but they were asking me the question um, with, with the earthquake that happened in Turkey, did you ever ask God why he didn't stop the earthquake? And my answer was, I didn't ask him why he started it. We used to call those things acts of God. And you say, well, Charles, can you really think that way? Think about the, the 40 day flood, the rain, 40 days and 40 nights, the flood of Noah. How many people would have been saying, God, why didn't you stop the rain for those people? How many people would have been praying that God rescue people from the flood that God sent? That's a challenge, isn't it? That's a challenge. And it brings us to that question, how much do you really believe that God is always right? There's a song I'm uh, familiar with <clears throat> that, that it, it talks about, I know the master of the wind. I know the maker of the rain. Do you believe that's God? Do you really believe that the creator of the universe has power over it? Because if you do, there'll be peace. So we come to this question, why do the wicked prosper? And we should deal with it because it's a challenge for folks. And, and the, I've already asked the question, do they? Right? Right? Do they really? And, and, and if we want a biblical example, we begin to think about the rich man and Lazarus, right? And, and Jesus tells the story of the rich man and the beggar Lazarus. And the rich man had everything he wanted on earth. He lived high off the hog. He had, you know, he had it all. I think the King James says, you know, he, he lived succulently or something of that nature. And, and, and he was doing real well. And outside of his electronic gate, said a beggar. Who didn't do so well on earth. And he had sores and the grace in his life was that dogs would come and lick his sores. That doesn't sound very fun. And they both died. And, and the rich man went to Hades and the beggar went to paradise. And, and I wonder, well, we know the answer if you've ever read the story. Would the rich man have traded all the earthly blessings of his life for a life in paradise. And then we could ask the question, would Lazarus have traded all the misery of his life to have blessings on earth so that he could spend a lifetime in Hades? And it brings us to this perspective when we say, do the wicked prosper? No, they don't. No one without God in their life truly prospers because God created humanity. And when God created humanity, he put in each one of us a God-shaped space. We can call it the Imago Dei, the image of God. When, when he said, let us make man in our image, God created something in you, a house where God dwells. We call it the spirit. And the only thing that fits in that space is God. And if you put anything else in that space, it's too small. 
Say, can you put anything in that space that's too big? Is there anything more infinite than God? And the problem of humanity and fallen nature is that man is constantly trying to fill their God-shaped space with things of this earth. And when we look at people and say, why do the wicked prosper? It's because in our hearts, we are looking at the things of this earth, thinking that they will fill the void that we have. But the void we have is that God isn't on the throne in the soul of man. And and actually, Debbie gave a, a little word about that last week when she said, you know, she's talking about the parable of the, the man, he decided, I'm going to build more storage barns. He's going to build bigger mini storages to put his stuff in. You know, I was a professional mover once, and uh, <laughs> you move stuff that you didn't know people saved. I, I kid you not, buckets of rocks. I moved, a, I moved a cast that some mom saved from when their kid's hip was broken. Just stuff. Just stuff. I'm pretty sure I moved some household trash at some point because they didn't know what was in it. And, and I put a lot of stuff in a lot of mini storages. And I'm pretty sure the rent on the mini storage could have bought nicer stuff. And so in the parable, the guy builds a bigger mini storage and and he says, now my soul is satisfied. And God shows up and says, you fool. Tonight I require your soul of you. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? And and we begin to grapple with these ideas when you ask the question, why do the wicked prosper? They don't. They just accumulate the things of this earth thinking they can fill a God-shaped space that they can't fill because only God does that. And it goes further when you think about it that um, the reward that the wicked have is limited to this earth. And we saw that even as we talked about the rich man of Lazarus. Would he have traded all the wealth of the earth for paradise in eternity? Yeah, he would have. Especially after realizing what it was really like. And maybe that's part of the struggle. Is, you know, and and I think it's the failure of of preaching to some extent that um, people don't know the seriousness of hell. They don't comprehend the seriousness of eternal torment. I remember my mom telling me before she came to the Lord and she was raised by atheists and taught not to go to church unless you were invited. So there is a, you know, that, that's, it's like totally set up to be lost forever. And her, one, there was a friend that tried, she said, when people try to talk to me about it, she'd say, I'm just going to go to hell and help the devil shovel coal. Because she didn't understand the gravity of that statement until after she came to the Lord. And then it was a different picture. And we, we, we have this culture in our post-Christian times that says, don't talk about hell. Don't preach about it. Don't challenge people. Don't convict. Don't let anyone ever feel guilty or shame over sin. And with that, we have people going to an eternal destiny without realizing the gravity of it. And you tell me which one's love. That was rhetorical. Don't bother. And 
And, and so Jeremiah, as he goes on, he mentions lip service in verse 2, right? And, the, and the paying lip service to God. This is speaking well of God with our mouths, but not living for him in our lives and hearts. And, and we do that. You know, people can do that. They can speak well of the Lord, but it's not getting down into the nitty-gritty aspects of who they are. And how many know you can pretend to be a Christian pretty much anywhere but home? And at home, you either are or you aren't. Makes it a little more difficult, doesn't it? I'm debating whether to tell you a story or not. Because it's about me, and I'd, I'd rather not, but I will. Um, <clears throat> it paints me in a good light. That's what's uncomfortable about it. Um, I remember my uh, son-in-law was telling me this story. He was in the conversation with someone else, and he'd lived in our house for six months and said, uh, t- was telling this other person, I've never heard Charles swear. I've lived in his house for six months. I've never heard him swear. Oh, he had to. Everybody does. No, I've never heard him. And Ashley, in her entire life, has never heard him. Now, the reason I'm bringing that up is I, I never heard my dad swear either. I know he did before he came to Jesus, but I didn't meet him, right, until I came to Jesus. I mean, until I was born. And, and I don't remember that particular event. But... Um, But I'm telling you this, that's not something you can fake. That's something you live because God has done a work. And and it's time for God's people to stop excusing things that aren't of the Lord. And I'm not trying to be mean about it. You know, I understand people are works in progress, but but the reality is it's time to take things seriously because God does. And and if you think that the postmodern preaching of today has given you an accurate picture of grace and sacrifice and judgment, you are completely mistaken. That when you read the scriptures, there is a much more tremendous weight on the shoulders of God's people to respond with obedience than our post-Christian culture and churches proclaim. They are in essence lying to themselves and thereby lying to you. And I know that's a bold statement, but that's, you know, That's how you rebuild a knucklehead. So Jeremiah mentions it, and and in short, what is he describing? Hypocrites. You play lip service, but nothing's happening. That's a hypocrite. And and I thought, okay, Lord, what's the... So yeah, you know, I asked God a, a genuine question. God, what's the point of hypocrisy? There's, There has to be a purpose that people believe that hypocrisy serves either subconsciously or consciously. What's the point? What's the goal of hypocrisy? I don't know. It might, maybe I'm the only one that's ever thought about that, but there has to, in all behaviors, there's a goal. And the Lord opened my eyes The point to hypocrisy is to gain earthly recognition for being more holy than you are. Think about that. The point to hypocrisy is to gain earthly recognition for being more holy than you actually are. Because you know, God sees you as, he sees the whole deal. He sees you as you are. Nothing's hidden from God. So the point of hypocrisy is to impress man. Which seems totally ridiculous. 
earthly recognition is the goal of hypocrisy. And I, 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 as I was going through that with the Lord, this question that came to my mind as an immediate just knee-jerk reaction to the idea was this. Could anything be more unimportant in life than that? I mean, really, what, what this world thinks of you has got to be the least important thing in the, sco- in, in the scope of humanity. Now, I'm going to ask a question I already know the answer to. You may not. Has anyone ever done a stupid thing while they're driving? Now, the answer is Yes. And the only people that haven't done stupid things while they were driving are people who don't drive. And sometimes when you're in a strange place where people don't know you and you don't know the area, you do more stupid things. And then you come back here and judge the tourists in Newport for doing the stupid things you did somewhere else. Right? It's like, idiots, what are they? (laughs) And if you're really rural-minded, you call them city-its. But um, what, what are they doing? And someone, just last week when you were on vacation in Bend or wherever you went, they were saying that about you. And, and and I remember doing such a thing, and because you know, I hate to admit it, but I'm one of you. I remember doing one of those things, and I did a stupid thing. And Debbie says, "Those people probably think you're an idiot." I said, "I don't know them, and I don't want to now." So what difference does it make? What other people think about me is none of my business. What God thinks matters. Ironically, where do we put most of our energy? Impressing people. Now consider the maturity of those giving the recognition and ask yourself if it's really worth it. When I consider that this is going to sound condescending because I'm being condescending. When I consider the emotional and spiritual maturity of the people of this 21st century of ours, I think we're living with a bunch of teenagers and I don't care what they think of Christianity. I said that out loud, didn't I? And it's time we grow up and think that way. And that was Jeremiah's challenge. That was, his whole ministry was a struggle. Jeremiah, you cannot care what the people you preach to think about you. It doesn't matter. They're going to want to kill you. They're going to throw you in jail. Their approval of what I'm calling you to do doesn't matter. And this isn't the idea of just, I'm going to be rebellious against everyone. It's the idea that when, what, when God approves of you, no other opinion matters. And, and so Jesus talked about hypocrites a little bit, you know. And I think he's right because, well, he's God. And so in Matthew 6, 1, and I'll read verse 2 also, he says this, Be careful not to do your good works in public in order to attract attention. If you do, your Father in heaven will not reward you. So when you give to the poor, don't announce it with trumpet fanfare. This is what hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets in order to be praised by people. Why are they being hypocrites? To be praised, yeah, Kelsey's the only one in the room listening. To be praised by people. 
You outclassed your dad right there, no problem. Um, <clears throat> thus, there's no eternal reward for that kind of religion. There is no eternal reward for a religion that wants to impress people. There is an eternal reward for people in relationship to Jesus Christ. And, and you know, it's, it, I was thinking of the, how the Lord was working in, in um, that song. What was the song that you, was the end that you went through a while? Rest on, Holy Spirit, rest on us. And, um, and it's, it's a good song. And when you sing it, it's like, wow. But you wait till he answers that prayer. He is going to boil your potatoes. He's going to turn you upside down and shake you until everything falls out of your boots. Because he's going to rest on you. You know, Jesus is, uh, you know, when it says every, everything that the rock falls on is, everyone that falls on the rock is broken, everything the ro and when everyone the rock falls on is crushed. You're either going to get broken or crushed when you encounter the Lord. And if you want to stay intact, you can only do that as long as you breathe there. But then your rebellion against he who will shatter you will take you to eternal damnation. In my lifetime, I've read a lot of sermons. I've, I've listened to them. I, you know, I've read, well, I've read a lot of everything. And, and uh, I think the most grace-filled sermon I have ever read in my life was when Jonathan Edwards wrote Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. When he wrote that we are walking over a tattered skin that's on above a fire that's being burnt and the only thing that keeps us from falling into the flames is the hand of God. That's grace. When he preached with such fervor that a congregation of people who didn't even know Jesus became converted, it started the great awakening of the church in America. When he did that, that was the most grace-filled act I have ever read in a sermon by anyone other than Christ himself. And you, you see this thing, don't, don't do your good works in public. And um, isn't, that, isn't that what people always do? And, and, and you know, and I, I, there, are some, there are some groups out there that do amazing things for kids, you know, hospitals and stuff. And I think it's sad that, you know, with your donation, you'll get this. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so we gave to one of those groups and there was a t-shirt of recognition. Debbie said, we don't want that. Don't waste your money on that. And I think about the church. How many times the church is bragging about its good deeds instead of walking humbly before God? The second question is environmental. I better look and see if we have time for the second question. We, we really don't. I think we'll just stop there. You know how to keep someone in suspense? I'll tell you tomorrow. Um, it's, it's cute. Kelsey's over there. Oh. No, we're going to save it till next week. Just for kicks. Mine. Um, but I, just to intro next week a little bit, it's a biblical question regarding sustainability. Now, you know where my text is going to be, what chapter. See if you can find the answer. 
What is causing the decline in our environment? What's causing the flora and the fauna to perish today? What's causing the demise of creation? The same thing that was causing it 2,600 years ago. So we'll start with that next week. Lord, bless you. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for everyone. And I, I just often, when I, when I see us come together, Lord, I, I keep coming back to that passage of scripture. I was glad when they said unto me, let us come into the house of the Lord, that we might do it together in Jesus' name. Amen.